Okay. Um, uh, due to the governor's order, what's the order number, Pete? Uh, 7B. Uh, due to the governor's order 7B, this meeting is being uh, recorded. Um, so uh, please speak candidly uh, and with uh, PG ratings. Um, guys, happy holidays to everyone. Thanks for being here today. Um, we have a uh, we don't have a real robust uh, agenda, but we do have some important things to talk about. Peter, do we have anything to vote on? I don't see anything here. Uh, no, no, nothing to vote on. Okay, great. Uh, well, good. Let's just, let's get started. We'll call the meeting to order. Uh, Peter, if we can start with the uh, a condensed version of the development projects update, that would be great. Sure. Uh, just a, a couple of things to be aware of the. Uh, uh, it's on the agenda, but the PNZ did approve the um, amendments to the self-storage regulation. So thanks to all of you who weighed in on that. Um, so that uh, is now uh, behind us and the new regulations are in place. The moratorium uh, is now over um, and we will see what the uh, future brings. PNZ also approved the uh, Popeye's uh, drive-through restaurant at 140 Silas Dean Highway. So that uh, did get through the uh, process. We just signed the uh, uh, permit and the mylars for the donut shop that's gonna go in across from the uh, town hall at 486 Silas Dean Highway. Um, we've been busy on some of the uh, uh, vacant uh, properties. I, I had a, a Zoom call with an interested developer for the Masonic building uh, two days ago. I got a call from an engineer for the um, nursing home on Jordan Lane. They are putting together um, a, a, a plan for that. We um, also um, uh, lost my train of thought on the last one. Um, so there are a couple of um, interesting uh, possibilities for those um, properties um, are on the, hopefully on the, on the horizon. Uh, clearing house, was that something you wanted to share? Anything on clearing house? Uh, yes, that was the other one. Thank you for uh, refreshing my memory. I did, uh, I have been speaking with uh, John Zubretsky, the owner of the uh, Church Street um, uh, former auction house gallery. Uh, he's uh, working on a couple of different things and is very, uh, interested in seeing something happen there. So yeah, as I said, a couple of, uh, a couple of new developments on some of those properties. Great, any questions from the group or comments from the group? All right, Peter, thank you. Um, you wanna blow some more life into the self-storage moratorium or uh, do you think you've covered that? Yeah, I think we covered it. The only um, a noteworthy thing on the final version of that is uh, we did add some language that would allow the Planning and Zoning Commission in unusual circumstances to allow the um, renovation of an existing building that might not meet the multi-story or the mixed use requirements. That was a concession made by the commission. Um, so that would potentially um, keep the door open for 1000 Silas Dean Highway to, to be converted. Um, there are certain criteria in there uh, that uh, the developer would have to meet, but nevertheless, that was a change that was made uh, kind of at the 11th hour to accommodate um, that particular, um, not, not necessarily that particular property, but the idea of letting an existing right. building be renovated for self-storage. Uh, so just um, wanted you to be aware of that. I will, I will send everybody um, a final version just so you have that for future reference. Great. Um, Pete, I know you and I talked um, about the business outreach uh, and the initiative. Um, everything has been approved. I know the printer has been dragged in. Yep. I know we we're um, going through and calling and finishing out the, uh, the list that you've got from the assessor's office to clean that up. I think that's probably the last hurdle that we've got to get through. Um, I know that you're stretched thin right now, uh, and I know that's a fairly long list. Would that put us, I mean, no one's, we're, this is an action that, that, that EDIC is taking. So no one is waiting uh, for that, although it's gonna be a valuable tool once we get it into the market. Um, we think we need maybe another few weeks on that uh, or, or long, because look, I know you're up to your eyeballs. 
Um, and I'm not Pro making excuses. Uh, if I was a betting man, the uh, mailing will probably go out not the uh, not the beginning of next week, but the beginning of the following week. Okay. Yep. We do have to. Uh, I we wanted to make sure we incorporated all of the new uh, businesses that the assessor had on file. So we are um, going through that and just making sure that everybody is going to be included on the file final mailing to the extent that we can. It does. It did require some field work to go out and check a few things. So um, those are the, I'll probably be able to carve out some time uh, mid to late next week to finalize that. So that therefore the mailing could go out the following week. Got it. Um, thank you. Any questions from the commission? Uh, I have one question, Mark. Um, yes, sir. On the, um, the survey, does the, the letter that we're sending out, does it have a link to a survey in it? And is the survey prepared yet? Yep, the survey, uh, we're using SurveyMonkey. That's all, that was done a while ago. So there will be a link uh, to that uh, incorporated into the, uh, into the letter, yep. Because there was, uh, just based on our last meeting, I, I wondered if, you know, if it makes sense to put something in the survey, any questions, um, that have to do with the Silestein Highway itself and any sort of, uh, you know, how people feel about the Silestein Highway for businesses that are located there or just any businesses in town. Uh, that's a great idea. I wish you said that two weeks ago, because <laughs> I, I do think it's a good idea. Um, let's take, it's a spatial issue, Pete. I know that we yeah. took a lot and we're condensing it. Let's take a look. I think it's a great idea, Tom. Anything we could do to begin um, uh, addressing any of the insight that either the, the um, um, not only people that own businesses in that area, but people that all these people that we're sending uh, this information or, or outreach to are, are consumers as well. So it would be good to get insight from both sides. Let's take a look at it. Um, Pete, is it at the printer and have they already laid it out or it's, it certainly wouldn't, wouldn't be too late. I mean, uh, he, he hasn't, done the print run yet on the hard copy and obviously modifying the survey is not not a big deal so it's just a matter of giving me some guidance on what that question is and what you're trying to get out of it so um you know we yeah can i wouldn't think I, I was just saying i wouldn't think that it would need to go in the letter itself even if it was just part of the survey it's just the survey that's a no-brainer yeah. yeah so yep. yeah if you if you want to get me a draft question um, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish, um, or if it's just an open-ended question. Um, and uh, obviously, Survey Monkey will do, you know, all the work on compiling that. So, um, if somebody wants to, you know, just make sure they get back to me as quick as they can. Hey, Tom, um, is it possible for you to get together uh, with Cindy and Gabe, um, and maybe just get some insight from them on what that question might look like? Um, um, offline? Sure. Yeah, I just think it's a simple, you know, it's one question or two questions, you know, uh, or, and, and, and I haven't seen what the draft survey itself looks like, but is there, it, does each question have a box for uh, extended comments or yes. would that be a one box uh, not, at the end or not, not, not everyone each question? Not an extended question, but yeah, it, you can do it either, however you want to format it. Sure. Okay. Um, and if you want to, if you want to just do a meeting on that or an email out on that time, if you could just include whatever you're doing, uh, just send an invite out to me as well. Sure. Whatever you decide to do to get together, if it's a phone call or whatever, just let me know if you don't mind. Sure. Great. Will do. Thank you. So, uh, Mark, Mark, just yeah. a quick comment as well. Um, so, can I don't know, maybe you can just refresh my memory. So, once we have obviously lots of email addresses, we've got lots of businesses responding. So, we've got them where we're going to have them in constant contact, right, Pete? Yes. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm not sure if they have the same survey type tools or some survey tools built in like MailChimp and others, but maybe we can even, you know, I'm just trying to think of like what our publishing schedule to like keep businesses apprised. Like I think the fact that we collect these, this information is great. The survey information is going to be very helpful and I hope a lot of people fill it out. Um, but at the end of the day, I'd like to just figure out like what does our publishing schedule look like going forward? You know, maybe once a month we give them an update or at least at least once every other month, something that blasts an email out and says, hey, you gave us your information, you gave us your email, and we're going to keep you in the loop. 
Um, I think that's one of the, that would be a great thing for us to just be ready for and just say like, even if it's just a couple small tidbits, like what you're talking about now, um, just a couple of small important updates that could affect lots of businesses. Um, I think it's a nice way for the commission to keep the conversation moving. Uh, Cause again, we won't have to worry about print anymore, right? So we're gonna try to just digitize this whole experience. Then we could just do it at the drop of a hat and say, send it today. Uh, and then it could just be sent out immediately to alert people. I think people, I think businesses, especially a lot of retail would really appreciate that on a more timely basis. Um, I think you bring up a good point, Marco. I know you don't own any stock in paper companies. Uh, so digital is everything. Um, I think one of the things um, that we, we, we want to bring to the table is working together with Deb and, and the chamber um, as well on once we get that address. And we did a couple, what I think were pretty successful uh, Zoom meetings, outreach to the business community on the different phases that we had in town and how it was impacting restaurants and retail, et cetera. And I think once we collect those email addresses, I think that's something we should do quarterly or twice a year. You don't want to overdo it or underdo it. Um, um, but that's certainly another thing that I want to, I think we can add to that very easily. Um, and Zoom has obviously proven to be a pretty successful tool and we can do that. Judy, you had a question? Yes. Um, once a, a new business comes to uh, registers with the town, would they now get automatically get this letter and the link to um, log on? That's a Peter question, I think. It's a great question. Um, we can continue to do this into the future and keep that um, link out there. So we certainly can do that. Um, but we would we would be adding them once we have their information to uh, all of the future uh, correspondence that we do send out. So, but, but it would be important for them to get this initial letter, I think, too. We can um, we can keep doing this into the future. Yeah, I we think that that's it, important. We used, we used to do it annually, so. Um, you know, we can talk about how this plays out going, uh, going forward. So I think as soon as they're registered, they should automatically get a letter and, and maybe it can be altered a little bit to say, welcome. Right. We would have to have a different letter, uh, but the survey would be, is an interesting thing to get to them as well. I, you know, two of the questions we have, what do you love about Weathers Hill? And what do you hate about Weathers Hill? Um, uh, which is, you know, cutting right to the chase. What do you like or don't like? Um, so that's a good point, Judy. Um, once we get this thing built, and the beautiful, beautiful thing about it is that, Pete, when, when, they, when a new business is registers in, in, in town, do we collect an email address? Is that part of what we, we do? Um, yeah, we, that's how we've been um, building the database, primarily through the new businesses that come to town. Usually they, they, have, to, they have to come through our office uh, mostly, and uh, so we, we start at that level. Okay. Mark, can I ask a question? Please, so Deb. I was going to... It was one of my questions I was going to save to the end, but it fits now. Um, how how do I find out when a, when a uh, new business is registered? I'm finding that I'm finding out as I like drive by and say, "Oh, I didn't know that business was was there," and I feel like I'm behind the eight ball with that. Is there any way I can get immediate access to that? Um, that would be. If there isn't a bridge built between Chamber and, and that right now, I would think that you'd have to reach out very easily to somebody in town to say if there's a new business that registers, can you just pass on that information? But I just want to pose the legal question. Does that, uh, do we violate any um, confidentiality or privacy issues by passing on a registered business to the Chamber? Um, I don't think so. I'm, we're not going to sell you know, the information to anybody. We're not, we're, we're just using it to improve uh, uh, communication. So um, yeah, I can't think of any, okay. you know, I thought it was just, to send, yeah. just to send a welcome letter yeah. to be yeah. honest. But who would I, so who would I bridge that with? Uh, through us. Okay. We'll just have Thank to discuss you. offline, you know, yeah. um, how you want to do that. Okay, thanks. And Deb, I think the only time it would be an issue, honestly, is if you like, if you just took it upon yourself to start adding those email addresses to your main email blast, for instance, without their consent. Um, that's the main thing. So any constant contact, MailChimp, I don't care what service you use for email marketing, they're yep. all the same. You have the ability to force it and they'll make you check a box that says, I have permission to add these 25 addresses to make exactly. it easier for you. Um, but at the end of the day, you know that's the thing you just want to avoid, I think. Thank you for that. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. 
Any other questions on item C? Okay, salute to business. Um, Pete, I know we had an issue uh, with the, uh, we've been using them forever, an issue on just getting plaques and stuff made on, on that. I know it's kind of like, you know, you have a big, you know, project and you pull out one little pin and the whole thing stops, but without those, we have an issue. What's the update with those guys? Are they, are they, work, are they back in business or are they still um, hamstring? So Mr. Trophy uh, is the contractor I think you're referring to. We have uh, had a longstanding relationship. Um, Butch, the owner has uh, retired. It's under new ownership. And um, let's just say they have not been as responsive as the previous um, ownership has been. And it's primarily because of the COVID pandemic. It's basically a one man operation. So um, luckily, well, I shouldn't say luckily, but Fortunately, we didn't have the uh, salute to business and had the deadline that we normally have or we wouldn't have our awards this year. So we have not received the um, awards yet from Mr. Trophy. Uh, they've been promised to us and Denise is trying to effort that as quickly as possible. So that's kind of a chain reaction and getting the videos done. So um, Denise was out today. So I don't know what the latest is, but there was some uh, conversation that it still may be a couple weeks out. Sorry to say. Good. Um, Brooke, I think she, uh, she, Brooke actually just said that she's got a contact in East Hartford, uh, which is good. Uh, I like the word discount trophy uh, since our budget is tight. Um, so if we have to go to plan B, let's, you know, Let's go to plan B. I'd like to keep the business there. I know they had ties to Weathersfield, the ownership, uh, but you know, if, yes. if, they're, if we have an issue, maybe we need to switch gears. Yeah, so I think after this, um, this batch, um, they've, they've ordered them and you know, so it's, in, it's already in motion. So I, but I think after this batch um, is done, we will be looking to see what other vendors uh, are out there. So if anybody has uh, vendors that they work with, for this type of thing, please um, let me know and we will be um, uh, taking a look at uh, changing up as we go forward. Any other questions on the salute to business? Okay, Pete, town guide and calendar. Uh, Pete, if you want, I will share my screen and I will show you that I have my message from the chairman uh, up. In, in a Word document, and it's I promise to give it to you within 30 minutes of the end of this meeting, so you have that piece from me. I, um, I, be, I believe you. Um, okay, I'm glad <laughs> somebody does. Um, any uh, any update on that? I know that we're we just need to get those pieces. I, and I think did the mayor get his in? Maybe I'm not as bad as every. If the mayor didn't get his in, then I feel good about that. I thought the mayor would. There, the mayor is uh, there. I, I'll let him speak for himself. Uh, he gave a thumbs up, I think. Okay. I got it. And now I see Gary looking down. I gave it to Gary for a quick review. Hopefully uh, he gives the thumb up, thumbs up as well. It's, uh, it's in process right now, everyone. So, okay. Um, no, it, it should be, uh, we just got to get it from Gary over to Peter. Right. If he hasn't done it already. Thank We're you, still Mr. waiting for our financial uh, report anyway. So, um, but yeah, we're, we're fine tuning, uh, all the details. So um, as soon as you can get that to us, it's less work. Normally this doesn't go out anyway to the first week of January because of the financial report requirement. So, uh, but nevertheless, if you can help us by getting that to us sooner and later, we can lock, lock that in and um, get it finalized. I have a question. How are those going to be uh, distributed this, this year? Um, where will they be available? So we have been um, driving around after the delivery, uh, dropping off boxes at all of the usual places. We may be rethinking that because of the, the pandemic. We've been doing it at the Keeney, at the community center, at the library. Um, if somebody has some other ideas on how we can get it into the hands of the residents or places where we've also been working with the businesses as well. So maybe we need to focus more on getting them in the hands of the uh, business community so they can give them directly to residents. Um, maybe 
well, I, I, I was going to say maybe churches, but um, obviously uh, they're yeah, limited as well with the pandemic. So um, I was thinking the food uh, food stores, you know, like Village and well, Lucky Loses Clothes, but any any place that people might go to get takeout. Yeah, we have been doing restaurants and food services, so we will continue that. So okay. Um, the library is um, open for limited hours, and I know yeah. we usually give a bunch to the library as well. So we do, we do. Um, I don't know if we, if the schools, if that's a, we we haven't really done the schools distribution to get it in the hands of families, but I, I don't know what the what's the what's the present situation with this with the schools. They're um, they're still on hybrid. The intention is to kind of keep them that way for as long as possible. Um, but parents can self select if they want their kids. But I I can't remember the percentage breakdown. But I want to say it's probably now I can't remember if it's thirty percent remote or thirty percent in school. Okay, I think it's about a third that are remote. Yeah, so it's thirty percent remote. Um, uh, that number has actually grown a little bit in the last week or two from the meeting that I just came from. So my thing is typically we would have like a backpack stuffer type program going on um, throughout different points of the year where we didn't do that this year. Um, if but, I can, I'll reach out to, to the superintendent and see if uh, that's a viable uh, option since some of our other normal options are going to be limited again. It might be a good idea to put them in the real estate offices because we so do many that. people yes. go in and out of there. Yeah, we do that every year. Okay. Any other questions regarding item E? Great. P, item F, business incentive programs. So yesterday I, I uh, listened in on an advanced CT webinar uh, with uh, DECD. Uh, representatives and um, the future potential uh, funding for in economic development incentives uh, that might uh, be coming our way is now um, going to be much more restrictive than it may have been in the past. So the DECD's focus uh, clearly from this webinar was uh, distressed municipalities, uh, communities with opportunity zones, um, communities um, that have larger corporate um, businesses that fit certain business sectors that the DECD is encouraging to come to Connecticut. I guess the, the bottom line is here, we are very unlikely uh, to be able to uh, have uh, businesses here in Wethersfield take advantage of future uh, DECD financial incentives because of uh, this direction. Um, so if we are going to offer um, anything more to potential development in the community, we're going to have to figure it out on our own, I think. So um, the need to have a conversation about future you know, business incentives uh, is probably more urgent than it's been in the past. So um, I just want to make sure you have that understanding. Um, it's not to say that there might not be a business that hits so, some of their criteria, but nevertheless, uh, the message and the takeaway that I got that the legislative efforts that DECD is pursuing um, would be very, have, have limited benefit to a community such as Weathersfield. So um, I guess that's the that's the news flash. And that was as of yesterday. Um, so I just want to make sure you're aware of that and that we go forward with this conversation with, with that information in mind. Pete or Gary, um, from the opportunity zone perspective, I know you have to have certain sections of, of a community or a business community to qualify, what are those qualifications? I know Sal Esteem probably, but is there any opportunity for Berlin Turnpike? Um, um, Silas Dean and, and or the Berlin Turnpike would not qualify. Um, there's uh, you know income guidelines um, um, 
It was an entire application process. Only cool. certain census tracts qualified within the state. There were about 72 statewide, and those are predominantly in major municipalities, Hartford, New Britain, Norwich, Waterbury, Torrington. Um, you, you're, we didn't make the cut, uh, although oddly enough, well, never mind. Um, but um, I, I worked in multiple communities that got it. So you're, we, we wouldn't. However, there is a certain percentage of those funds that can be allocated towards abutting, um, abutting uh, zones or abutting census tracts. So the reality is we might have some overlay with Hartford, but we don't, we can't directly compete for it. Our only choice would be to try to leverage it if, uh, if a developer was doing something in another municipality that had a qualifying, we might be able to uh, piggyback or they might be able to invest in outside of the opportunity zone. I, I wanna just fix one of my statements. It wasn't that it has to be in a butter, it just, um, if they put 90%, or at least last I looked, it was 90%, the legislation was kind of never finalized. 90% um, of their funds into an opportunity zone, they could put 10% else, else, elsewhere. Um, so we might you know, be able to go after a developer who is working somewhere else who would be willing to give 10% of their funds to us. Okay. Or invest 10% of their funds to us. I heard what I expected to hear. I just wanted to ask it again. Um, um, any additional questions on, that, that should say lack of business incentive programs, Peter, is what that should say on the agenda. Um, any other questions? Comments, no? Okay, um, item G, the 2014 STEEP Award. Um, as you guys know, we've had earmarked for uh, 1000 South Steen, the Weight Watchers building, um, back in 2014, there was $200,000 um, granted uh, towards that particular project. It was, it was designed for that particular and, and um, installed for that particular project. Um, you know, we've, we've have been trying to exhaust opportunities for that particular um, uh, piece of business for a long period of time. Um, and we are in the process, which I think we touched on a little bit at the last meeting on um, if you don't use it, uh, you're going to lose it. Uh, the, uh, I guess the good news is um, we don't have a myriad of projects that require that type of money. The last five or six years, we've done a pretty good job, um, you know, filling up the Salestine Highway and, and, and Berlin Turnpike. Um, but that money is in, is, is in dire straits if we don't find a user for it. I know Gary is working on getting a potential extension. Um, one thought that we had uh, at the last meeting uh, was to see if we could get that reallocated uh, to our facade improvement program. Uh, that 200,000, which is a working, it's worked really well. We've been able to use those uh, funds for great use uh, here in town. Um, uh, but that money really is was designed for kind of a shovel ready project to be earmarked. So it would have to be um, you know, we'd have to have a good case for it um, on trying to get that because, as Pete said, um, and CIP is coming up in a second, it doesn't look like we're going to have a lot of funding uh, for on a go forward basis, at least through next year on our facade improvement uh, program. And we have, we're waiting very patiently uh, with the town to tell us how much we actually have left in that, um, in that account. Um, we're still waiting. Uh, I, I think we thought it was in the area of fifty to sixty thousand dollars left, but we, we need to get a firm number on that. There are some issues that, that we're trying to uh, to get uh, uh, resolved. Um, Gary, I don't know if you want to speak to that. I, I just want the group to know that it's hard to know that we have two hundred thousand dollars sitting. And we can't find a use for it. It's a bizarre uh, issue. Um, Julia. Yeah, I had a question. So. Is it specifically need to be used for silestine or are we just reserving it for silestine for the 1000 silestine? Sorry, it was originally submitted specifically for 1000 silestine. So if we were, we would have to request uh, the funding to be reprogrammed to something else. And the message we're getting from the state is that they want us to basically spend the money as soon as possible. So we're trying to find something that's you know ready to uh, hit the ground. So we would have to go through a process. 
and argue um, you know, the benefits of that project and then the timing of that project so that we could get an agreement uh, to have continue to have access to that funds for the uh, short term anyway. So the developer that you talked to, I think you said for Jordan Lane, would that could if they have a, a if they have a plan or a project that could we reallocate it to something like that, for example, in case that building needs to be torn down or just I mean, that building is is going to need some help. I think we could we we could reprogram it to most anything, assuming we had a good argument about the benefits to the community. Um, I mean, things. would that would that help in 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 helping move those projects along, whether it's the Masonic Building or Jordan Lane, where you seem to have two interested parties, if we split it or in some, you know, percentage proportion, would it provide incentive enough to get those developers going? I think if we start divvying it up into separate projects, it loses its value to who, okay. whoever. So, um, plus it further just complicates you know, getting okay. the money spent. So I, I did just for the record, um, have a conversation with the owner of um, the Church Street uh, former auction gallery about um, using, you know, con contributing towards that project. And there seems to be uh, an interest there, uh, which may help to be a catalyst to see that project uh, come online sooner. So that's um, at this point, and, and Mark and I have talked about the facade program, we just don't have any facade projects uh, pending. Maybe if we did a news flash and promoted the availability of the funds, it might get some people uh, more motivated. Um, so that was the other idea, but that would also take time. Uh, so we were just trying to figure out the biggest bang for our buck and, you know, getting the money spent uh, as, as soon as we, as we can. So we're open. Uh, two ideas, but we just ultimately have to sell it to the state. And, and, and then more importantly, it, they've just got to make sure they give us some additional time uh, to do that, because no matter what we focus on, it's still going to take uh, time for it to happen. Here, you want to share anything on that? Or I think we got that covered. No, that was actually a pretty concise and precise uh, response. They, they want us to spend the money. We just got to, we kind of have to dance for it. And it's got to be a strong enough application for OPM to approve our uh, repurposing of it. And I think they're, the state would be supportive of the right project. Um, what do you, what type of a time frame do we have? I know October, I think the last time you were with us, you said it was October, was the, the end of October was the date and you've been dancing since, how much more time do you have on the dance floor? They're not necessarily clear with that, but I got the sense that time is of the essence and it's urgent. Um, keep in mind that the closer you get to the state looking to get a budget in place, the sooner they're gonna say, okay, we need to start sweeping money from here, here, and here. So we don't, we're not gonna have a lot of time to, to be you know, if we had a project in the queue, my guess is we'd be fine. If we don't, um, I have concerns. They haven't specifically said yes or no, but I, not my first rodeo with this type of thing. And I kind of know where they're going. Judy? Well, uh, I had reached out to um, Bryce at uh, the Charles. Um, he eventually is going to want to do some landscaping there and things for uh, to improve for next year or for beyond that. But um, my question is, what has to be in place? Does he have to have a final project in place to apply? Or can it be just a design that he would like to and then work on it later? And I think that the heirloom market would be another place to reach out to they're going to uh, be expanding and I think they might want to do uh, a facade improvement as well. So if we had a couple of those, would it help? Uh, we need to have a, a, we, we had conversations with the owners of Auction House as well, a uh, face-to-face -face meeting a few weeks ago, and they need to be able to show us, um, you know, well, on the facade improvement program specifically, yes, they need to have a design they need to have, you, you've seen the stuff, Judy, that we get when we voted on uh, those particular projects. Um, they don't have to be 
super polished. You've seen what we got from La Noche was written on the back of a napkin at times, I think, and we mm -hmm. still muddled through that. Um, but uh, yes, they need to have a project and it has to be you know, something that fits within the facade improvement guidelines. Um, well, I know that Bryce has already had a, a conversations with an architect. So my suggestion was get it on paper and submit it. Yeah. Um, would that be reasonable? If it could be real, I mean, again, that money, the 200,000 would have to be reallocated to the facade improvement first. program okay. first before we'd have to go through that hoop to get it there. And I mean, that could be part of the argument. I mean, if right. they can come forward, um, Peter and I talked earlier about Comstock and in, in light of what's going on there on their um, re-engineering of their business, so to speak. So, uh, I mean, if, if tell Bryce to call us. Yeah, uh, if he's I, got a project, okay. now would be the point that if we can go back um, um, and give Gary some ammunition on some strong local projects that would fall underneath the facade improvement program, which we're underfunded on, that could potentially be a way. So I would have them contact us. Um, okay. And the same thing with uh, Heirloom Market, Comstock, Pete. Um, same. Have they been in touch with you at all, Peter? Um, I know extensions don't count for facade improvement. O existing, it has to be something existing, but have they contacted you for any of that? Um, they, they haven't contacted, well, they're not really doing anything that would trigger the facade funding on the outside of the building. Most of their uh, improvements are internal. Um, and we really haven't talked because we don't have a program like that that would provide funding for internal renovations and you know um, inventory and, and those kinds of things. So you know that's the kind of conversation I think we need to have um, maybe at a finance committee meeting to see if we should be developing a program like that uh, to not only encourage exterior improvements but to encourage business upgrades, interior, that kind of thing. So. Um, so I, I have not uh, offered anything to them because we really don't have the program in place to offer that. Peter, that's that's a really great point uh, about maybe considering a secondary program. I'll I'm not saying I'm against any one of the things that Judy just mentioned. I would want to probably default and go back to the terms of the original grant. It, the intent may have been, you know, you have a number of underperforming properties within town that could increase your grand list or create jobs or employment or kind of diversify your grand list. And I'm just wondering if the intent is really to get some of those back online <laughs> improvements that have a have a um, kind of a ripple effect, not taking anything away from Spiro and the work done at Heirloom or Bryce or anything. And, you know, I would never want to uh, dampen that. It's just, you know, we want to go back and make sure we're sticking with what the terms are if we're going to make this argument. And, and if we can't, we can't. I'd rather not lose the money and give it to, to an existing business and stabilize an existing business. Don't misunderstand me. I just want to be careful that we're using it, that we're considering the usages. Any other questions regarding item G? Great, Peter, item 4A, the CIP. So it's, it's that time of year again where the um... Town is soliciting proposals from all departments for our capital improvement program budget. Uh, last year, um, because of the um, you know the competition and the limited amount of funding, uh, we passed on asking for any funding. So uh, last year we we did not get uh, anything. Uh, in the past, we have asked and received uh, money for the facade program primarily. Um, a couple of other smaller uh, projects, but um, we are gearing up for that process. And I wanted to uh, see if the commission had a particular uh, project or projects that they wanted to request uh, funding for uh, as that process is now gearing up. I don't want to miss the boat for you guys. So if we want facade money, and now would be the time um, to prepare that submission and ask for uh, that funding particularly in light of what I said earlier in the meeting about state access to state funding. And um, Peter, not to harp on that particular thing, but we can't really go to CIP until we know exactly what we've got in the till uh, for the facade program, is that correct? Well, it's, it will be part of the uh, equation. They'll wanna know what we've got, but I, by my, um, 
accounting. Uh, once again, I'm not uh, in the finance department. You know, we had uh, you know roughly sixty thousand dollars left uh, in the pot. Um, so that's over the next two year, next year and a half, we would probably be able only to fund two projects with that sixty thousand, or maybe just one project. And obviously, it's fifty thousand max, so we could you know be down to ten grand or so with one project of any significance. So you, you should at least be aware um, that's kind of the neighborhood of funding that we have left. Peter, over the years, the minimum amount that they've ever given to uh, the facade loan program was $25,000. That's correct. I don't think it would, I wouldn't think it would hurt to at least put in a request for 25 so that if they come up with a maximum budget amount and need a filler to fill it with, we could get that 25 and as a you know, facade project comes up, we'd have the money to do it. So, I mean, you know, to put it in, I think for that amount, you know, is it gonna hurt? Yeah, um, what are the, um, um, I think that's kind of a no brainer. I'd like to hear from the rest of the commission. Um, <laughs> basically the question is, you know, should we go to uh, um, in the CIP process and request that money? Um, um, I, anybody say no, I think would be better, okay. Um, so Pete, whatever, if the minimum is 25, um, let's go for what we can go. It's a, it's probably the facade improvement program has been probably the main jewel, uh, of what EDIC has been able to do over the last 10 years, if not longer. Um, so. I would go probably for go for 50 under the theory that, you know, if they are going to cut that least we could fall back to the 25. So if, if that's okay, uh, with everybody, um, I, th I think, what is the average, uh, Pete, with just off the top of your head, what's the average uh, amount that we have uh, approved for EDIC? I, in, uh, you mean project. giving money out to our facade program? Yeah, average project. I would say the average, I analyzed this not that long ago. I think it's um, about 30,000 average. So We've given out a lot of uh, 50s uh, recently. So right. they, te they tend to be recently, the average has been higher than that. So, but I, throughout the whole program and the 40 or so projects we funded, it's, I think, been a around 30. Um, hey, uh, Mark. Please. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's Thompson. So I joined a while ago. Um, question on this money, is this only for um, facade improvement type work or, or, or where does the money come from if there needs to be a study done for a property or something else around the development front? That, that would be something else. Um, we really don't have uh, a pot of money for something uh, like uh, a study without getting a grant or um, something else. Um, we do have some studies on the horizon that we're going to have to uh, uh, discuss. Um, when I met with the manager, our, our plan of conservation and development uh, expires in a couple of years, and it takes a year or so ahead of that to complete a plan of development. So that's also on the horizon. If you had a particular study that you're thinking about, we probably should start talking about that. There, there might be grants out there, though, depending on what you're talking about. So, so it would be so. So, this money here that we would be asking for, these particular funds, would be primarily for something like facade improvement, with other special projects being funded differently from different sources. It could be funded through this capital improvement program. Uh, other studies have been funded through that uh, in the past. So, um, so it would be it would qualify. Uh, to pursue funding through the CIP for, for a study. Once again, depending on what it is. Peter, when we go, when we request the money from, from CIP, um, I think we should probably um, share with them the average number of projects that we've done over the last three or four years in the average amount. And just, cause I think last year we, I think we did at least five or six projects last year. Um, that, that might be high. Yeah, um, that's high. That's high. Yeah, we just uh, we're not, about not twenty. I'm I'm nineteen probably, but this past year not many. Um, right. And if the average project is thirty thousand, you know, if we ask for fifty, we could say, look, basically what you're doing is 
allowing us to fund almost two projects. Um, and I know we've been averaging more than that since the uh, beginning of the program. Um, so I think that's a good argument to make to them when we request that money. Yeah, we, we usually do. I usually submit a whole packet of support documents that explain to them what we've done with the projects. Any other discussion on item A, CIP? Okay, um, Salestine Highway. Um, I'm glad that we've got Gabe and Cindy on the call here today uh, as well. Um, uh, the last time we discussed and looking at my notes, I know that Tom had expressed an interest and Judy had expressed an interest on potentially putting together a group. Um, I will take the responsibility uh, uh, for saying that we've done nothing since then. Um, and it's, um, if I could have done something, um, uh, I would, that, that right now, as you guys may imagine, or you may have witnessed, the town is stretched uh, beyond limit right now on trying to get um, anything put together. I'm hoping that by, you know, in the next 60 days, now that we've got a vaccine, hopefully that they're gonna approve today and whatnot, things can calm down and we can get to a better sense of normalcy. But that doesn't stop um, uh, the group uh, themselves on, on getting together. And the last time um, we, um, we got together, we said, maybe it would be good to put an ad hoc uh, uh, meeting together, maybe just to meet um, with, a, at the beginning, at least a loose agenda. I'd be happy to, to help put that meeting together uh, for any other interested parties in that. As I said before, I'm not going to get involved in anything that doesn't have a very specific game plan um, and, that, and, and a mission that's realistic um, uh, because a, a lot of the things that we're talking about are going to boil down to economics. Uh, if we were in a, a, you know, a bull market and we were flush with money, it would be a pretty easy meeting to have, but we're not in that scenario. So I want to be realistic. I want to be um, uh, brutally honest on what we can do and can't do at the very beginning, because time is valuable. Um, Cindy and Gabe, um, your thoughts on that? And again, I'd be happy to um, put together that first meeting. And I know I mentioned, I think Tom and Judy had mentioned they'd be interested, but I'm interested to get um, your thoughts on what I just shared. Gabe? Um, can you hear me? We can hear you now, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I am. Um, I just want, I got additional information from the last time we um, spoke and I just wanted to share it with the committee. Um, many of you may or may not be aware that I, um, on the building at 912 Silestine, I put in new guardrails in a parking lot. So I went through uh, refinancing and uh, with that, I'm so, can you hear that or am I getting a bad? Like an echo. Oh, I'm sorry. Here you go. No pressure, Gabe. Uh, bear with me one second. Um, while Gabe is um, uh, healing his technical difficulty, anybody here have a, a, a good relationship? I'm with sorry, colleague? I, I'm back. A anyway, I went through the process of refinancing because I, like I said, did a new parking lot and guardrails. And during that um, process of refinancing, I had to get an appraisal for the property. And what I discovered was, is that the appraisal of the property at 912 Silestine Highway is 11% less than what the town has the property assessed at from 2018. And it's 30% less than when I purchased the property in 2006. And arguably it's one of the, you know, more um, uh, better locations on the Silestine uh, Highway. And it really has had about the same occupancy level since I've had the building, roughly around 85%. Additionally, during that same time period, the 10-year treasury interest rates have gone from 4.8% down to 1%, which usually lends itself to is on real estate. And this wasn't the case. Um, and at the same point, um, 
real estate taxes have gone up at 5% per year compounded annually since I purchased the building. So these are colliding forces. And I, I guess what I'm saying is, and what I've talked about before is, is that I would rather see mon less money into the facade program and not have money like that and put it more towards an initiative to have a comprehensive approach as, as to what to do with the Silestine Highway if you have limited resources. Um, I, I think doing one or two projects sounds great, but having a comprehensive plan um, is much more of a proactive approach in getting businesses than reactive. I think sometimes like when we, when you look at like a facade program, in many ways it's reactive. A business comes in, decides to do something and we, you're reacting to the business as opposed to maybe having a comprehensive plan, trying to improve the Silestine Highway. So it's more of a proactive business where people try to, uh, businesses try to uh, are attracted and come to the Silestine Highway. Um, so I would be open to any committee and I recognize that the resources are limited, but I think the allocation in a way should be more of, as I described, more of a proactive situation than, than that reactive. And, and maybe um, just, it's maybe the same dollars and whatever. Uh, in other towns, sometimes they have referendums to talk and, and get the voters as to whether or not they want to allocate money towards um, a potential study of one of their major thoroughfares. Great, thank you for that, Gabe. Cindy, did you want to uh, share as well? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Well, I mentioned in the last meeting um, about um, uh, various towns uh, that I had um, that we're familiar with in Connecticut, and we had mentioned that um, Glastonbury is a, si a town of similar population uh, density. Uh, length of the corridor. And so uh, what I did was I spoke to the community development director in Glastonbury, uh, Ms. Uh, Kara Dodds, and she was very, I uh, spent some time with me and she described the town's planning and the coordination and the implementation process uh, for the main street in Glastonbury. And I'll just share with you a few things um, because I think it provides a, a very good template uh, for future actions. So uh, she pointed out that generally Glastonbury Main Street uh, streetscaping reflects the broad consensus and support uh, in the community for a main quarter that reflects the charm, as she called it, the charm and historic character of the town. So for any improvements along Main Street, there's a heavy emphasis on design. Uh, the Main Street and downtown areas are defined by key zoning districts and the planning and prioritizing are set accordingly. Uh, the streetscape improvements require a coordinated effort on the part of three departments in town, the economic development, engineering, and planning and zoning. Uh, and uh, I'm sure the mayor's office and uh, uh, the uh, manager, city manager. The public input is considered, is a part of it, but it seems that it doesn't slow down the process or it, it doesn't require it every, uh, it's not required every step in the way. What she described was a sort of a general consensus that uh, for the aesthetic and the functional goals of the downtown district. Um, Glastonbury's implementation of the downtown, my, my impression, and then uh, she directed me to some planning documents and work already underway, obviously, uh, that they're uh, about 10 or 15 years ahead of Weathersfield in, in their efforts. So um, we need to begin this process now. We may not have money, but when we do, we need to be really ready for it and we have a plan in place. Um, now the, the key planning documents and I can get the URLs for these and I'd like to study them myself. Um, and some of these we have. Uh, they have a 2018, 2028 plan of conservation development. We have one that's, that's uh, older than that, but we have one. Uh, we have a, they had a town center traffic study. I think we have a traffic study. Peter, is that right? A traffic study? Do we have a town tra traffic study? No, we do not. For Silestine? No. Okay. Uh, and they have what is called the complete streets study. And uh, it's called the complete streets policy. 
And um, it, it doesn't look like it's kind of set in stone. It's really more of a, of a document that expresses, uh, I have to get her, her, her um, I don't know if this is actually in zoning, um, but um, it says the purpose is to consider the needs of users of all abilities and ages, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit users, vehicle operators in the planning, programming, design, construction, reconstruction, retrofit, operations and maintenance activities related to all roads and streets. So they, it, the title for the economic development officer there is uh, community and economic development. So I think it's part and parcel of, of the whole usage idea of uh, and the point of quarters and who they're for and not just um, for, um, for automobiles. Uh, and then they go on to describe the objectives and benefits, the procedures, the exemptions, um, and so on. Uh, so I think that's something that you know, kind of provides a vision uh, and then that is sort of incorporated at all stages in the engineering, planning and zoning uh, and so on. Um, then uh, they, they had zoning regulations enacted in 2014-15, establishing those zoning, key zoning districts along Main Street and the downtown area. Um, I'll also say that there is, um, they have a, uh, in their uh, planning and development, um, they had a, it, oh, I know, it's their, their traffic study. And with it, they have, um, it, it's really very little narrative. Almost all of it is uh, mapping and planning and so on. And then it's um, very specific su suggestions for, um, you know, for curbs and where you need to offset curbs and where you need to mark out a more clearly pedestrian. And, and, and it, uh, on a very, very, street level um, and a pictorial level um, in, in detail describes what needs to be done on the, um, on the main street. And that was put together by Fussen and Neil and also Ferraro Hickson Associates, uh, which are landscapers, so uh, landscape designers. So between the two city planners and landscape designers, they came up with a really detailed plan of action for the Silas Dina Highway. So, um, Gabe and I discussed this, um, uh, kind of this uh, a bit of information that we received from Glastonbury and I think uh, we concur that it provides a really good template for future actions um, uh, for the town of Wethersfield. So uh, my recommendation uh, is, and Gabe, you can, uh, if you want to support this, uh, is for the EDIC planning and zoning engineering department should review our pl town planning documents and consider Glastonbury's planning and zoning documents to request funding for a consultant to develop a Silas Dean Highway streetscaping proposal and budget. And we can craft it out for grant funding and so on. Really have it on the shelf. Okay, maybe th this is not the great <laughs> the budget year we, we would hope for, uh, but I think we could scrape together enough money um, like um, what Gabe had mentioned, maybe not just a one one on one reactive type uh, facade program for the first phase of implementation. So uh, have a plan ready for um, uh, that traffic, the, the design and traffic study for the Silas Dean Highway for next year. And so we're this is kind of where we are in the planning process. And in the meantime, we can uh, develop a co committee that you know looks at things like the complete street policy, develops the vision, and so on. Um. Great, thank you for that, Cindy. Thank you for uh, doing that exploratory stuff in Glastonbury. Um, have you, Pete? Does the, or I should ask you, Cindy? Do, do you guys have you seen the most recent plan for the South Dean Highway that was done? I think it was done by Fuss and O'Neill. Um, is that right, Pete? Have you seen that one? Was that two thousand eight? When was the last uh, Silas Dean? 2006. 2006. Um, is, is that something we can share? I believe it's on the website right now. So um, okay. it's available for the public. It, it would be um, just uh, Mark, so you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, when uh, Gary and I met to discuss the CIP, uh, we did discuss, um, you know, there, there are a couple of documents out there that need to be updated, including the plan of development. Um, and we should be discussing 
uh, you know, the need for a strategic uh, plan as well. So, um, and obviously our Silestine Highway Master Plan, even though it was from 2006, would, would become the, you know, the platform under which we review uh, that specifically for the Silestine Highway. So, um, so it's really a matter of seeing where the, you know, we, we don't need the money for the plan of development quite this fiscal year. However, there's no reason why we couldn't start the planning now um, and do it sooner than later. So that's a whole conversation that I think, um, you know, we, we probably need to need to have um, to make that make that call if we wanted to do that. Yeah, the, the POCD, POCD is every 10 years required by state every 10 years. We're coming up to, what is this year? Probably seven or eight. Lost track of the numbers. Year eight. Seven. Yeah. Um, about eight. So we're going to, you know, starting it early is not a problem because it is kind of a large endeavor. Um, but we'd have to put money aside to kind of build in for a consultant probably starting this year would, would be the recommendation. It's a fifty to seventy-five thousand uh, dollar effort, somewhere in that range. Is the traffic study done in Glastonbury? The traffic study was separate and apart from the plan of, of development. Yeah, they did a traffic study. Uh, if you notice, they've uh, constructed a roundabout. So uh, I'm sure the traffic study uh, really focused on implementing a roundabout and what the traffic impacts would be. So it was probably specifically for that project. It may not have been an overall community traffic study. Uh, it was probably specifically, if you have the uh, URLs for that, uh, would be I'd be happy to take a look at that and, and see what the scope of that was. I, I can uh, pass along to you if you, and if you want to send it to the uh, town, uh, the uh, committee as well. Yep. And yep. I can. Go ahead. Sorry, Cindy. Uh, and I can uh, post the um, the uh, complete streets policy as well. Just so you know, Cindy, we have a complete streets policy as well. It was just adopted this past summer. So great. Yeah, the only thing I was so I was going to mention the complete streets, and I know that um, saw Councillor Penelow actually posted that in the um, in the notes section that we had a, that council had adopted it. So thank you. Um, and that the we do have a number of traffic studies and traffic counts related to the Silestine Highway from the various projects surrounding it. But those weren't done by us. Those were done by you know businesses looking to build or expand, and they're in certain corridors. Um, and obviously, we use some of that information related to engineering um, and and planning. So, but nothing that's specific, because um, again, it's costly. And I think that was kind of the point that you raised: is you have to have a plan on how you implement each section. Um, it's just how, when, and can we get approval? Right. It seems that the, a number of plans in Glastonbury weren't all that recent. Um, they yeah. had the general plans, but what they did have was a traffic study, and they had the detailed landscaping and, you know, the very kind of on the ground, what do you do to the street, and, and solid recommendations by specialists. To the street study include the parking study? Is that the same uh, same study? I, no. I couldn't tell you. I haven't read it yet. I'm sorry, Cindy. I was talking to Pete as well. It's okay. Uh, no, the complete streets uh, policy was a separate effort, primarily uh, done by the uh, bike pedestrian uh, advisory committee. Um, the parking study was a planning and zoning commission. Um, I mean, that really looked at just supply availability and, and future demand for parking rather than um, a specific streetscape study. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, um, you know, to Gabe and to Deb and Judy, Tom, and anybody else, um, what we can do is I'd like to maybe um, this week I'm jammed, but maybe find some time next week. I know we're approaching for some of the holiday, uh, but maybe just to sit down and maybe kind of map out um, kind of a 30,000 uh, foot view of what the overall game plan is. And I really want to take, you know, what you guys feel is important, especially you, Gabe, as a property owner on the South Dean, take and look at what we, again, realistically can do. 
you don't know me from Adam, but I'm a kind of a can-do person, but I'm also very realistic. And whatever we can, whatever is in our grasp, um, either from a, uh, a just a personal time perspective in a treasure perspective or finance perspective, I just want to make sure that what we're talking about makes sense. And as you said, Cindy, I agree. Maybe this is something we work on when we have money. There's no, you have to start somewhere. So I'm, I concur with that. Um, so if you guys would like, I'll just reach out um, uh, to you guys. Um, I don't know if I've got your personal emails. Um, if you wouldn't mind shooting me an email, if I give you mine, would you mind that? Um, it's um, it, just shoot me an email and I'll shoot an email back and we'll schedule a meeting. My personal email is mwtrahan, T-R-A-H-A-N, at msn.com. Hey, Mark, can I just say one, one thing? Sure, Tom. Um, well, I guess it's a couple of questions. Something to think about is that that Fuston O'Neill study from 2006, is that something that would be cheaper if we just asked them to refresh it? Are we allowed to do that? Is there like a bidding procedure or could we just go back to them and say, this is what you did 14 years ago. Would you do anything different if it was today? in terms of uh, streetscaping and, and landscaping and everything else. And number two, the thing is, is once you have a plan in place, it doesn't necessarily mean, boom, you're gonna do three miles of the Silestine Highway, which is kind of overwhelming for everybody and financially overwhelming. You can chunk it up a bit and go, you know, half mile to half mile. And once you build something, then the people see it, they'll determine whether or not they like it, and then you can move on from there. Um, so. I, I, I have no idea what, what a project would cost, like what Fuss and O'Neill proposed. Um, it would be helpful if there was just a rough dollar figure, you know, and then you can decide where you might want to, what, what you might, you can focus on corners, you know, intersections, things like that, that just show people what it can look like. Um, Pete? So we, we do have bidding requirements. It depends on the, the value of the uh, contract, whether we would have to go out and uh, competitively bid it. But the bottom line is that would that study would become the basis for us, you know, going forward and, and updating it. And certainly the starting point would be to review it and then determine its validity today. So um, so yeah, I think we can we can talk about that at the when we have a meeting about the options. Peter is Fuss and O'Neill on our list of uh, <clears throat> approved engineers we already have under contract or to use through engineering? If so, you know, maybe we could use them for this only from the standpoint, you know, if they were to refresh what they did, it'd be cheaper than somebody going in and starting from scratch. So you might want to check with Derek to see if he's on that, if they're on that list. I yep. think they might be because they were in the past. They've been on the past. I don't know what the updated yep. list is, so we can find out. Okay, good. So the ball's in my court, uh, Gabe and Cindy. Uh, with regards to putting together a Zoom call. Um, so please expect, you'll see someone the next day or two. Um, and I'll propose a couple of times um, and we'll, we'll hone it down on what works for everybody. I know it's kind of like herding cats at one point trying to get everybody scheduled, but we'll, we'll begin. Um, Thank great. Thank you. And thanks to the uh, Peter and the committee. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Um, uh, any other questions on Salestine Highway, item 4B? Item 4C, State of the Town event, Pete? Yeah, it's on the horizon. I'll let uh, Deb, if you're still with us, if you wanna jump in and, uh, and share with us uh, how, how you're gonna do that this, um, this year. Yeah, well, we, we uh, have the Keeney Memorials uh, Reserve for the 16th of January. Don't know if, if we can uh, pull that off. If we can't pull that off, we're gonna do a virtual. So we'll be working on that soon. Um, because it looks like that's probably the way we're going to have to go with that, sadly enough. Um, we did that with the, um, the best of, we did a virtual and it worked out great, but we'll, I'll give you more on that once we get that going, but either way, we're going to do it on, on January 16th. January 16th, you said, Deb? January 16th, yeah. Thank you. So I'll be reaching out to everybody for what we need from you. Is there virtual cocktails at that event? How does that work? 
<laughs> BYOB. Breakfast. It's breakfast. It's called it's it's called pour, pour it in your coffee cup. That's what it's called. Yeah. Hey, Deb. Yeah. It's breakfast. Those That's your response. Saturday. What's that, Gary? I laughed at Peter. He goes, no, it's breakfast. <laughs> well, uh, Pete's, Pete's from Scotland, so that explains a lot. Um, <laughs> Leslie, uh, okay. I'm sorry. The 16th uh, is actually on a Saturday next year. Am I so looking at that? Maybe you want to check the date? No, it's the third. Sorry, maybe I'm, I, you know what? I'm stuck in my bedroom because I have people over, over people staying here today. So I don't have the, my calendar for it. It's the third Thursday in January. So the 21st? Yes, yeah, the third Thursday in January. I'm sorry about that, you guys. It looks like the 20th. Yeah. The, okay, thank you. 21st. 21st? I'm like sitting with, it. yeah, so kind of stuck in my bedroom right now. Uh, just too much information, Deb, but thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, Mark. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm on Amazon doing my Christmas shopping for you, Mark. Uh, very good. Uh, the list is coming. Um, Mr. Manager, do you have anything to share? That seems like a loaded question. Um, yeah, so a few. So I'll start with the you know the real positive, uh, great, awesome event. Uh, the tree lighting last Thursday, led by uh, the mayor um, and kind of our version of Holiday on Main that had to take place this year. I kind of gave kudos to town staff who was at, who were able to pull it off, as well as Chamber of Commerce Deb Raymond um, and the shopkeepers um, for pushing it. There were, although there was no scheduled. Uh, you know, you're used to seeing thousands of people kind of crammed into that area due to COVID. We obviously couldn't do it, um, but it was still a fairly decent turnout. There were a lot of people strolling up and down Main Street um, supporting the businesses, and that's great. Um, so that's kind of a positive. Someone later on during the, the other uh, speakers want to talk about how great the event was. Uh, by all means, I'm not going to spend a ton on it. Just a few quick things. Holiday, uh, as part of the tree lighting, I did mention that. Um, we're doing the holiday gift program this year a little differently. Uh, we're encouraging people to donate um, money rather than toys, uh, just for obviously COVID purposes. And what we then do is we turn around and then we provide gift cards to the family based off of how many people are in the family uh, per person. That's kind of the information set and available online. We're encouraging people to go online to the town website and kind of through Parks and Rec, Rec Tracker, they can click on a link and pay that way or do a check. Um, as well. Um, and I did mention this as well, if, uh, if there's someone not only who needs, um, you know, especially with COVID, if you're finding that people need, have mental health or physical health concerns that um, kind of been brought to your attention, they can also reach out to social and youth services and help with some, they're able to help with some guidance there. Uh, holiday time plus COVID is probably, is not a very good combination for those who um, need assistance. And frankly, for people who have not previously needed assistance, uh, assistance might be feeling it this year more than ever. Um, the, we had a social justice coalition meeting on November 30th. Um, the focus was, or it was entitled, Our Town, Our Commitment, Setting Priorities. That is a heavy focus again on, on social justice. There were about 100 people who attended this. We've been averaging about 100 people per meeting. Um, we actually thought at some point we'd be able to kind of break down into smaller uh, groups um, to move forward. We're still heading in that direction. Um, but it, so at, this, at that particular meeting, we did break down into some groups, but not to focus on any specific category. It was to have each group kind of run through a process as to what they felt the priority should be for the town. Um, and there were four groups. Those four groups are going to get together next. The, the captains of those four groups are going to get together next week and kind of uh, take the information and come up with what they would want to recommend as the priorities for the town to work on. The next meeting is scheduled for January 5th, and it's entitled Our Collective Responsibility. So what we're doing with a lot of these is it's not only... Um, having community dialogue, but it's also some education and some training and some understanding um, from a number of different platforms to kind of just encourage dialogue between all the different members. Um, and it's been very diverse. The conversations have been fantastic and very open 
and honest. And uh, I hope that continues. I expect that will continue through it. Um, other things related to town government. Um, we're seeing COVID numbers on the rise. The report that I just got prior to this meeting is that in the last seven days, we jumped 129 people. That is the most significant jump that we've seen um, since we started counting in a one week period. Um, the week before was 60. The week before that was 90. And I wanna say the week before that was 70. So we had, you know, and going even before it was 50. So we were kind of heading up. We had a short drop, then we had Thanksgiving. And now we're 129 people in a week. So uh, if there was any ever any indication or a question of whether or not this is still here and breaking any social distancing uh, can cause that to uh, rapidly um, change, I think Thanksgiving was kind of a telltale for us. The town as a policy is still trying to encourage individuals, social distancing, good hand washing, wear masks, um, and we're trying to enforce as best as we can and consider limiting your um, your exposure to other individuals, as frustrating as that may be. Um, and we're up to about 16 deaths, unfortunately. Um, on the school side, I didn't pull all of the school information. They do have about 10 cases so far this week, which is a big jump. Nine out of those 10 uh, resulted in, um, we were able to reduce a significant amount of the quarantine as a result because school stayed out for an extra week after Thanksgiving, or, um, you know, if you kind of counted the time, they kind of extended it. Uh, the concern would have been if they came back that next week, it would have been much worse. And uh, I think Michael Emmett, to his credit, uh, holding them out an extra week, you're now starting to see that number go down a little bit. So because of that, we're continuing here on the town hall um, to have uh, restricted um, by appointment only entering the building. Uh, we're doing that for the safety of the employees and any residents. We don't want to pass this inadvertently to people coming in and out of the building. So it is by appointment only, except for in the month of January, we will for the tax collector, the assessor's office. Actually, that's it. Tax collector and assessor's office will allow individuals to come uh, between nine, um, between nine and three. However, they're still going to get stopped at the front desk. They're still going to have to sign in and we're still going to have protocols on whether or not we'll allow them in depending upon how many are in line or in the building and we can meet social distancing requirements. But uh, In true form, the town wants to collect, it, collect its taxes, so we're trying to be as flexible as possible. For those looking to pay their taxes, you still have the option to pay online if they're not escrowed in your mortgages, mortgage already or if you're a large commercial vendor. Um, you can also go to People's Bank and make a deposit there. We collect at People's, uh, any one of the branches. And you can also, um, again, always pay by check and money order through standard mail. But um, we're trying to be as proficient as possible in allowing uh, business and property owners to pay in a variety of ways. I'm not missing anything. Uh, positive news, and I don't know, oh, she had to jump off. Brooke Penders had to leave, but um, Keisha Farms Committee, uh, for those of you, just as a quick update, the, the Keisha Farms Committee meets every month. Um, initially, our plan was to focus on hiring a consultant to do an analysis of potential reuses of that town. It would include, of all things, a traffic study and impact in that area, um, as well as, um, go through, bring the town through a series of charrettes, or public meetings, engagement meetings to try to get a feel for what the community wanted to see there. And then they were gonna go back and research whether or not any of those things, you know, the top three or the top five things that the community wanted or advocated for to see what the feasibility was of something surviving there, whether it was um, uh, sports facilities, sports fields, um, not that you could do a business, but a business, a housing development, uh, whatever it may be, their job was to do an analysis. Unfortunately, as we know, COVID has been uh, very uh, challenging for us. This process took back, started back in February. The council obviously not knowing what this financial crisis could be associated with COVID, um, took a very conservative approach to ensure um, that vital services were the focus and they, we had to shelf hiring a consultant. Um, so to be creative, and make sure we were moving forward. Um, the group 
reached out and we partnered with the University of Hartford to have a conversation to see if they could do probably not the same level that a consultant could do, but to see if um, that type of uh, consultant could do, but to see what they could do by leveraging their engineering department, their architectural design department, um, um, illustration, economics and business um, development and um, um, government. Um, and so we've been meeting with them. We've engaged, Brooke happens to work for the University of Hartford. Um, we engage with her and they've been moving, moving forward with tagging students to actually be charged uh, with um, doing a lot of this legwork. And we're trying to coordinate that with the um, high school so that the high school students also see a potential career path for themselves, tying them to you know, university work. And so our meeting last month or last week, um, we saw members from the University of Hartford do their first introductions to us, give us a little background on what they've done and what their experience is, and then talk to their, um, uh, their advisor um, who has experience doing this for other communities, Worcester, um, Massachusetts um, is the most recent one that he had worked in and done something similar. So it's kind of a, a great cross collaboration between youth and uh, professionals and hopefully we'll be able to pull something forward in the next six to eight months, which would also go back to the community visioning sessions. We're actually working on how we can tag in social media, Twitter, um, and um, community-wide surveys to help develop what, again, the conversation could be, be there. So, um, and I think that's probably, I wanna make sure there's nothing overly of concern. Highland Street, almost finished with that. We've started projects at North and Heather Road doing drainage improvements, those should be done soon. I think that's probably the big, biggest information for now. That concludes my report. You're on mute. You're on mute. Um, um, Councillor Penelo, your turn. Yeah, I'll just I'll kind of make mine a little bit briefer. Um, I'll just kind of walk everybody through just some of the stuff that uh, we wrapped up on council the last two meetings, uh, kind of following what Gary uh, just provided with his update about Keisha Farm. Uh, council approved uh, hiring a consultant to write a grant to actually study if there's any historical significance in Keisha Barn. So they are looking at that avenue. Uh, we also accepted two grants totaling, uh, I think it was like $1.5 million for road improvements in the Spring Street Pond area. Um, I don't know if anybody's driven down that area, but that's in, in dire need of some improvements. Um, we also uh, uh, approved a uh, energy procurement to, to actually decrease the cost of electricity for the town that, I mean, it'll probably save us roughly a hundred thousand dollars over the next three years, but um, not a significant amount of money, but it's a save nonetheless. Um, we also voted to approve the uh, local 818 union contract uh, last meeting. Um, we did see also see some, some uh, financial savings with the new contract, but um, I do believe it was fair to the members of the union as well as to kind of ease the burden of the taxpayer. Uh, what else do I got? Um, oh, and yesterday we actually uh, conducted uh, the interviews with the final round of candidates for the town clerk position. Uh, so council will actually be uh, probably getting together next week, uh, later next week to probably wrap that up. So that's where I'll leave it for now. Great. Uh, Pat, is on the grant for Spring Street, um, is there... Is part of that parking down there if people want to visit that area is or is it just really just re-engineering that area what goes into that i i don't know anything about it i believe it was just the road improvements right gary i don't think there was anything having to do with parking it, it, it's a unique project uh yeah. it's it's somewhat undefined uh we have some flexibility it, it's it's about a million um it, pat what pat said was uh, there's it's a combination of road improvements for other areas and and down there um, there were actually two grants, the, um, but a total of 1.5 is what he said. Uh, the, uh, it could include street improvements. It's to address issues with the pond and the dam, and it could be streetscape improvements as well. It, it kind of has some flexibility. Uh, the engineers, there was a plan done in 2000, 
think it's 2009. Um, and so some of those components are, we're gonna try to implement a lot of those components from the 2009 plan to envision that area. Um, the, uh, there was a lot of advocacy from Senator Funfar and the delegation working with the council uh, to try to push that through. And the council was gracious enough to accept the money um, coming That's through. Great. So we'll, there'll be more details. There'll be more conversations with the community about what's going there um, as, we, as we get ramped up. For those of you that have been in town for a long time, um, I mean, I remember in uh, the mid seventies to early eighties, uh, there actually, you know, Spring Street was a, a great spot for skating. Uh, the town actually had a guard down there, you know, uh, to supervise it and whatnot. And it was uh, at that, at that I don't know if, I would love to figure out that, but with regards to adding to the value of property, which I know came up in this area, it's not a big thing, but it was a, a really neat place to, for families and uh, pick people want to pick up a pickup hockey game could play. It was a very, very neat facility. It was, I don't know if it even, if it, if it came under Parks and Rec, Pete, I don't know if you were here then, but I, if it was under Parks and Rec at the time, um, Spring Street. Um, Judy, I see your head going. I think I probably skated down there with you uh, back in the day. Um, Mark, my parents did, where, I'm sorry? Mark, I was going to say that's where I almost uh, lost my ears to frostbite several times from playing hockey. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to say, Gary, are we going to put in a rink down there? Is that what we're talking about? A uh, nice outdoor rink. <laughs> Well, I just I, uh, I don't uh, think that was one of those things, although based off of everything going on with race and COVID, I, I don't know if you're going to see a ring. Maybe we could capitalize on all the ones that may have to close because because of this. Well, it was Mother Nature induced. There was nothing. There was no labor other than Mother Nature and 32 degrees. That was it. Um, all right. Um, thank you for that, uh, uh, Patrick. Uh, PNZ. I don't know if we have a uh, official PNZ um, liaison yet, Pete. Uh, we do. It's uh, George Oichel. I did invite him. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why he couldn't couldn't make it. But as I mentioned, uh, uh, the two main things were the regulation amendments for self storage and the uh, uh, Popeye's chicken restaurant approval. And and by the way, just to uh, to address, um, thank you to the members uh, and to Pete, uh, especially on the moratorium uh, work that we did on that. That was a long time coming, and we've got the desired result. And I really feel it will make a difference on that property at one point. Um, so thank you to everyone who worked on that. Um, Heritage, G, uh, Judy? Uh, not a lot to say, but um, the last meeting on November 24th, um, uh, it was reported that there, uh, it was voted that we would have a, a brochure distribution again this year. Um, it's at uh, Jennings Road exit that the travel center is, Hartford Travel Center. And they have a digital screen and book that people can get information from for destinations and weather seals in there. And uh, it is self-contained evidently, so you don't have to be driving into the Jennings Road area. So, and there's brochures and the digital um, board there for people that want to visit. The other thing is the Web Dean Stevens has a new director, Joshua Campbell Torres. Um, that's probably information you already have. And the Weathersfield, oh, Weathersfield shopkeepers are going to have late hours, Thursdays and Fridays um, till 8 p.m. And the restaurants will be open till 10. Of course, all that's COVID dependent. So um, that's all I have to report. Great. Judy, is that one of those fake backgrounds behind you or is that real? No, I'm actually at my son's house. This is their dining room. So uh, it's nicer than mine. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, thank you, Judy. Um, Deb? Um, so as Judy just touched upon, I've been working, I went to a couple of the shopkeeper meetings. And um, after that, we worked behind the scenes on getting them open late. Uh, for the holidays um, and they we worked out a give back program so if you go there to get people to re uh, visit them after the holidays in January so they're giving out bonuses for that so support them and um, I'm sure you've seen the flyer but I can send it out to everybody if you haven't um, holidays on Maine of course we had to cancel um, the chamber raises our money for social services in the barn every year for that with our 
raffles and our trees. Instead of that, we're doing a virtual auction, which is finally put together and it's gonna be going out today. So I'd love to send that to everybody. We have some great donations and we had some, um, some good sponsors. So we'd like to be able to donate some money to social services through that uh, vehicle. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to send that out. We've already touched on the, um, it is January 21st for the state of the town. I'll be reaching out to everybody to um, help me with that. Starting January 7th, we're gonna start our quarterly meetings uh, with the town again. So if you could put that in your books and I'll, I'll send that out. We The dates were not consistent in 2020 because of COVID and things that were going on with changes for that. Uh, the chamber has also started some legislative meetings. We had our first one this week with uh, the, two of the state reps. We're gonna be inviting um, uh, town officials and state officials and Gover Governor Lamont actually said he would do one with us as well. So we'll, we'll send that invitation out to everybody. That the, the um, small business members seem to want to uh, chat with them. So that was, that was very productive. Uh, we also started uh, virtual net networking with the small businesses. We started out with probably only eight people attending and now we're up to like 20. So if anybody is interested in that, um, you, you don't have to be a chamber member if you want to join and, and get to know people face to face. So that has spurred probably four direct solid referrals for these small businesses. So that has been very, very productive. I'm, I'm really happy with that. Um, that's about what we've been doing. Uh, plus don't forget Judy's uh, luminaries. We're um, pushing that out uh, in, in our, the e-blast as well. So uh, they go fast, so go buy those. And I think that is the end for me. Oh, then the other thing we did this this month was uh, well in November, you know, Connecticut Cares came out with a five thousand dollar grant for small businesses. I was able to because I'm on those webinars. I was able to help several of our um, our small businesses in town apply for those grants, and they should be getting them the end of December. Five thousand dollars isn't a lot of money, but it certainly is helpful to these these businesses that are struggling right now. So. Shop local, as you guys know. That's what uh, I have. Great, thank you, Deb. I wanted to let you know. Um, in the business outreach uh, piece, we did add a nice blurb in there on um, to consider the chamber uh, in that, which you requested at the last meeting. Could you be put in there? So we did okay. add you in there. Thank uh, you very much. Yep. Um, okay, I have nothing to really report. As you know, I get Gabby throughout this thing. Um, the new head of the shopkeepers is Joe Pascali. Anybody know Joe or Deb, you work with him? Um, yeah, he he's, go ahead. Yeah, you, he's got so much energy. It's yeah, he, he's, he's a great addition to that. You go home and you need to take a nap. He's got so much energy. It's great. Um, yeah. Do you have his contact information or can you email that to me? Sure. Okay. Um, subcommittee uh, reports, marketing and communications. I don't think we have anything there, Peter or financial strategies. Is that correct? Uh, we, we probably should set up a financial strategies to discuss the business incentive um, programs and whether we want to pursue something in the future. Do you want to get the calendar out? Sure. It's not urgent, so it's if you wanted, to, you wanted it to wait till after the holidays, that's fine. Well, yeah, you know what, let's, let's just put a, count, a date out like maybe the first week of January, if that's all right. Okay. But let's just get it on the calendar. Uh, the week of the fourth. Any thoughts, Pete? On a yeah, I'm, I'm pretty. I'm pretty flexible that that far out. So. Yep. Why don't we do Monday the fourth? What's the uh, What's the earliest that makes sense? Eight Eight thirty is fine with me. Eight thirty. Great.
Anybody that would like to join on um, January 4th at 8.30 on the financial plan, uh, please uh, please join us. Tony, I know we can always get you in there. Um, all right, um, and in minutes, if you guys will take a moment, take a minute to look at the minutes. And if, once somebody's comfortable to make a motion to approve. Mark, I'll make a motion. I'll second it. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Uh, very good. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for January 14th. Uh, Peter, any correspondence? Sorry, none, none for you. Negative? Negative. Right. I, um, I have a... Um, yep. This is yes, Cindy. Yeah, I know. Uh, if we're at the comment section, are sure. you ready to close? Yeah. Um, last month, I um, had uh, suggested that we have uh, the town has a uh, should reach out to restaurant owners and um, also develop a sort of an outdoor outdoor dining uh, sort of expedited application. I didn't see it on the meeting here. I was wondering if anything came up in terms of planning and zoning. I haven't really kind of gone to them. Uh, with that suggestion. Cindy, um, we have a program already in place. There's an application process. It's on the town website. Um, all restaurants uh, under the governor's executive order uh, are eligible to submit for that. Uh, it's expedited. It's 10 days. Um, so that that uh, I didn't want to interrupt you last time around, but we've already, oh, okay. got, we already got that in, in place. Oh, great. Good to know. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? Thank you, Cindy. Okay, I'm going to make a motion uh, to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, turn aye, off your aye. computer. Aye. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. <laughs>